Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Right, you came back after last week. That's good. My name is Josh. I'll be uh, sharing the message today, as Sharon alluded to earlier. Ryan was running, uh, I guess, only 10 miles. <laughs> Seems kind of wimpy to me. I don't know about you, but uh, of course, I'm not doing it, so I probably shouldn't say anything like that, right? Uh, last week, Ryan, he began this series called Tough Miracle. And uh, how many of you experienced some great miracle this past week? Anybody? Uh, how many of you would say, as you come into this place, there's something going on in your life, something that you're facing, some obstacle that's kind of in your way, you say, I could use a miracle. Anybody? Yeah. Miracles. Um, you know, as we were... As we were kind of putting this series together, and even as Ryan was talking about last week, and I was thinking about this message today, I can't help but kind of wonder and let my mind race around this idea of whatever happened to miracles anyway. All right, so Ryan talked about uh, miracles that can take place in our lives. He gave the illustration, reminded us of the story of Lazarus, this guy that was dead for four days, and because God wanted to show and exemplify his glory through Jesus, allowed for him to, his sickness to ultimately lead him to death, and there be in the grave for four days, and Jesus went and raised him from the dead. We all applaud, right? What a great miracle. Uh, how many of you have ever witnessed that kind of miracle before? Anybody? I'm going to have you come up here later on and just kind of share that story. Oh, not something that we see every day, is it? And so my question is, what, what happened to miracles? Um, why is it that we uh, don't see the kinds of things that we read about in the Bible to the degree and frequency uh, that we read in the Bible, right? Because, um, I don't know, if maybe your experience has been a little different from mine, but uh, I'm not just, I'm not walking around, you know, seeing miracle after miracle every day. And so what, <coughs> what happened to miracle? I think this is kind of a, a, a good opening question for us to think about as we consider the work of the supernatural in our lives, right? Because the Bible tells us that God works supernaturally, that he suspends the laws of the universe, right? That he suspends the laws of physics at certain times, and miracles take place. And perhaps you're here today, and you'd say, well, I've experienced the miraculous in my life. I, I know what it's like to have experienced the supernatural, something that took place that should not have, that something that went on that, that had no business of going on. So, so what are we to think about miracles? Well, I think um, we are, we're, we're kind of conditioned uh, to, to not readily believe that miracles are going to take place, right? I think this is one of the just kind of one of the conditions as we sit in a, in, a, in, a, in a sanctuary like this and listen to a message about miracles, in the back of our minds, we think, oh, that sounds great and that sounds wonderful, but we, through our experiences, have been conditioned to not really be ready to the point where we're expecting the miraculous to, happening, to happen. And part of that is because, well, we don't see it happening now. Right, again, like I said, it's not like miracle after miracle is necessarily taking place. And chances are that you and I have not been called to the kind of life that Paul and the apostles and other followers of Jesus in the early days of the church, when we read in the book of Acts, all of these miracles being performed, right? I mean, Jesus said to his followers, he said, you will do greater works than I did. This, this, this idea that they would go out and they would perform even more of the fantastic things that Jesus had done, they were going to be responsible for carrying on that kind of gospel presentation. And so here we are, fast forward into 2018, wondering, well, where is the miraculous when it comes to the church? And we've been conditioned through our experiences sometimes to not be ready or expecting of the miraculous. The other thing I think sometimes that we, that we face is that the miracles we read about in the Bible, they're just... They're just a little out of touch for our reality, right? Again, like Ryan talks about Lazarus being dead for four days. Jesus went and raised him from the dead. And, and again, we think, well, that's fantastic, but man, that doesn't help me with the little miracle I'm looking for right now, right? You're sitting out there, just, you think, you know, a miracle would be if he got up off his duff and washed the dishes for once. 
right? The little miracle that you're asking for is that, man, if she would just see how sore my shoulders were and just give me a good shoulder rub, I mean, that'd be a miracle if she did something like that. Right? We read about the miracles in the Bible. Jesus healing the blind, they're receiving their sight. The deaf are beginning to hear again. The, those who are paralyzed, even from birth, all of a sudden strength has been put into their legs, and now they're running around, jumping and dancing. And we read those kind of stories, and it's so easy for us to just go quickly through them because it doesn't necessarily resonate with the daily occurrences of our lives. Right? Not too often am I walking around raising the dead healing the blind, seeing the paralyzed spring to life. No. But there is one thing that's certainly true about miracles. We all want them. We're all sitting here today probably hoping, wishing that something that is supernatural would fix whatever it is that we may be going through, whatever obstacle it is that's presently challenging us. Because we all come to this place where we're faced with this very confusing question, right? At times, perhaps you're here today, but certainly it's happened before, it'll happen again. We find ourselves in a situation asking ourselves this very confusing question, how, how did I end up here? How did I end up here? You might be asking yourself that this morning. <laughs> Man, how did I end up here today? I didn't know Josh was going to be talking. Man, it's going to be a miracle he ever gets done. I, how did I end up here, right? I, uh, Think back over the course of your life and maybe the choices that you made, the, the, uh, the, the decisions that kind of defined a period of your life brought you to a certain place and maybe there just, there came this point where you came to this sudden awareness of, wow, this is not what I expected for my life. This is not where I expected to be at this point in time. Here I am, 25 years old, 30 years old, 50 years old, 70 years old. My life is not what I had expected it to become. And so you ask yourself the question, well, how did I end up here? How is it that my choices that I thought, were making, I, thought I was making for my own good, my own benefit, they led me to this place where now today I, I feel kind of disappointed with the way things turned out. Like, I'm not super happy and excited about where I am right now. And, and so you start thinking and your mind goes racing you know, trying to answer the question, how did I end up here? We often face this sobering reality that sometimes there are, there are cir uh, uh, circumstances and uh, things that, that kind of pop in our lives that are just, they're too big for us to fix. They're just too big for us to deal with. You know, we've modeled this series after the Tough Mudder event, right? This event that challenges human beings to incredible physical feats. Right? Feats that are going to require tenacity, dexterity, the ability to go on when your body says it can't go on anymore, cooperation and teamwork, the ability to see something at the end of, you know, beyond what, what you're presently experiencing and the, and the pain that you're going through. And, and that, that really speaks to kind of the reality of our lives that we, we walk through such things that are that are seemingly more difficult than any human being should ever have to go through. You know, I can't imagine what it must be like to go through the death of a child. What it must be like to wake up that next day and that child that you brought into this world that's no longer with you is gone. I can't imagine some of the other tragedies and difficulties and circumstances that we as human beings living under the curse of sin are sometimes asked to go through. These obstacles that present themselves that we say, hey, this is way too much that I should ever have to deal with. This load is much too big for me to ever be able to bear. And so we find ourselves, whether asking the question, how did I end up here, or facing an obstacle that seems too big, we're looking for the miraculous to happen. Hoping, searching, waiting. So what happened to miracles? What, what, what ultimately kind of leads us into those places? Well, I want to I want to talk to, uh, uh, this morning a, a little bit about the life of uh, a guy by the name of Paul. Chances are you know him. He wrote a good part of the New Testament, was responsible for bringing the gospel of Christ to uh, all over kind of the known world there, founding churches, writing letters, raising up the next generation of leaders, just kind of doing all these incredible things but you know what? There's a part of 
a really big part of Paul's story that we sometimes rush very, very quickly over. And that's the experience, the encounter that he had where everything in his life changed. Like we kind of understand, yeah, there was this moment where Paul, then called Saul, experienced Jesus Christ, was confronted by the Lord Jesus himself, and then everything changed. But, man, I just, sometimes I think we, we fail to really dwell on the significance of what that must have meant for a guy by the name of, of Saul. This guy who, you know, was um, considered to be one of the great uh, pharisaical leaders of his day. Uh, he lived contemporaneously with Jesus, and he was... He was, uh, he was around, you know, probably depending on the timeline, as we understand it, finishing up rabbinical college, you know, as Jesus was ministering and ultimately being crucified on the cross. And we were introduced to Paul as an enemy of the church, as an enemy of, of those people that are following Jesus, the people that believed in the death and resurrection of Christ and are now talking to their fellow Jewish people, saying the Messiah has come, he was crucified, he paid the penalty for our sins, and now he's raised from the dead, right? That's what we celebrated last week with Easter, right? And so, so these Jewish people are now beginning to tell other Jews, right? And they're following this way, Jesus Christ. And, and Paul, he's a great enemy. I mean, he sees Christianity or the, 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 the following of Jesus Christ as being the greatest threat to Jewish life. And so that's how we're introduced to him, as one who was attending the martyrdom of people who were following Christ, of somebody who himself was going out seeking to destroy this movement at its very core because he considered it to be so dangerous. And that's where we pick up in Acts chapter 9, the story of Paul's life, starting in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul, and I'll use Saul and Paul interchangeably, he's the same person, split personality, Maybe something that you can identify with this morning. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Now, let that sit in there for a second, right? We love Paul's letters. Paul writes this letter to the Corinthian church, and then he writes another letter to the Corinthian church, and Paul writes to the Galatian church, and the Ephesian church, and the Philippian church, and Paul writes letters to Timothy, this guy, this protege, this guy that's going to come up and follow in his footsteps and be a great leader for Jesus Christ, right? We, we read all those things that Paul was responsible for. The rest of the book of Acts is kind of committed to telling about Paul's journeys throughout the world and all the work that he did for Jesus. We hear in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, with every breath he was uttering threats and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, right? So he goes to the, to, to the chief ruler, the chief religious and political ruler of Judaism at the time, the high priest, and he's seeking the blessing of the high priest to go to the various synagogues scattered throughout Israel, and the rest of the world, so that they can stop this movement. He asked for their cooperation in the arrest of followers of the way that he found there, right? So now he's wanting to go to Damascus specifically and arrest everybody that's, that, that would consider themselves to be a follower of Jesus. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Well, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, right, we talk about Paul, four missionary journeys, really he had five, because right? he started out this missionary journey thinking that he was doing some great favor for God. As Paul was approaching Damascus on this mission, a, fight, uh, 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 a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That had to have been quite an experience. I imagine there was some soiling of the toga or whatever it is that the, he and the men that were with him were wearing that day. Like clean up in aisle 11 all of a sudden there on the road to Damascus, right? Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul has no idea who it is that he's facing. 
He certainly has his attention, but he asks for identification because he doesn't even know who he's talking to. And the voice replied, I am Jesus. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with, Paul, with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus, and he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Just let that experience settle in for a moment. That experience of what it must have been. I mean, Saul, he is on his way to Damascus. He is ready to... Uh, he is just ready to, to take on anything that comes his way. And he is on a mission, zealous for God, zealous for what he thought his entire life's purpose to that point was kind of like, as he thought about his upbringing, and as he thought about his education, as he thought about what he had committed himself to, he, he couldn't help but feel like everything in his life was leading him to this point where he was going to be instrumental in stamping out what was presently the greatest threat to the Jewish way of life, greater than, than Rome that had seized control of Israel and was now subjugating the Jewish people, forcing them to pay tribute and to live under their laws, despite the fact that they were allowed to live in some you know, kind of ethnic subculture there in Israel. Even greater than the threat of of Rome, even greater than the threat of Hellenism, the, the, the spread of, of the Greek way of life that had happened for hundreds and hundreds of years that was, that, was, that was getting absorbed into the cultures of many people and were kind of blending people together. Even greater than that threat of losing their absolute Jewish identity than what the Greeks could do, than what the Romans could do, is what these followers of Jesus Christ might do. Right, because they had a crazy message. A crazy message about some paragon. Some weirdo. Some guy who was out to lunch preaching some ulterior message. Who was crucified for his wrongdoing. Who was put in a grave. And now they're saying that he rose up from that grave and the tomb is empty. We've got to put a stop to this. Paul thought everything in his life had led him to this point, and now all of a sudden he was faced with the reality he had gotten it all wrong. Man, what a sobering reality that must be, or must have been for, for Paul, and what a sobering reality that is for you and me as we, maybe in a big way like that, but maybe in even smaller ways throughout our lives, just kind of come to grips with the fact that gosh, the way I had been going about this was all wrong. You know, I thought, I thought I was making the right decisions for myself. I thought I was doing the right thing. I was certainly following what it is that I thought would be good for me. But man, I just, I can't help but argue with, like, this is not what I wanted. This is not where I wanted to be. And the Bible tells us that Paul's associates brought him to Damascus. And for three days, he sat there in blindness, in darkness, utter darkness, and didn't eat or drink. Now, we know that he was there for three days, but Paul didn't know how long he was going to be there for. Just imagine, put yourself in his shoes for a moment. You just got confronted by the very being that you had been persecuting, that you, had, you were living your life completely against, right? He just confronted you with your life. And now here you are sitting there, in the biggest timeout ever given to a human being, wondering what is going on. How did I get here? How did I get it all so wrong? How did I miss it? I mean, think about, we're talking about the miraculous. You know what's miraculous? What's miraculous is that the God of the universe would become a human being and would die on a cross for you and me. That's miraculous. And what's even crazier is the Jewish people, they were waiting for a Messiah to come and deliver him. Them. And yet, even though the scriptures pointed to who this Messiah would be, they missed it. Paul, despite all of his learning, despite all of his education, despite his upbringing, he got it all wrong. And all of a sudden, what's his life worth? What does his life mean? You ever feel that way? 
You ever find yourself just wondering, contemplating, how did I get here? How did I... You ever spend those three days in darkness just wondering what's next? Man, I can't imagine, you know. That first day goes by, he goes to bed, wakes up the next morning, he's still blind, waiting to hear something, nothing comes. Lives out the rest of that day, day number two. Goes to bed, wakes up the next morning, day number three. Nothing's changed. Got to be wondering, how long is this going to be going on for? Right? Three days in darkness, asking himself, how did I end it here? And probably wrestling with the question, is what I have done, is how I have lived my life, is it too big for me to fix now? Is this obstacle just something that's far too big for me to handle? Well, Saul very quickly realized that the miracle he needed in his life, this miracle of life transformation, was going to take a great deal of vision. And it's funny how God took away that very thing from him. He took away from him the ability to see with his physical eyes so that he could begin to see what he really needed to see because miracles take vision. The miraculous that we need to see in our life, it takes vision. Now, vision is the ability to see what can be. So you and I, we, we live out our lives, and we're, we're so often just kind of overwhelmed by everything that's going on around us, and we get lost in the weeds of our circumstances, right? The situations and the obstacles that present themselves before us, we're just we're caught in the middle of it, overwhelmed of the, at the bigness of, of the situation that we find ourselves in, unsure of how to get out of it. Unsure of how to scale that wall or traverse that ravine. It takes vision, the ability to see what can be. You know, these people running the Tough Mudder course, they have to be able to see beyond what it is that they're physically experiencing, right? Because the pain is real and the pain is harsh and it feels like this obstacle that's in front of me should be too big for me to conquer, but they have to have the vision to believe that they can do it in order to get by. Now, vision, it requires a few things. In order for Paul to kind of move from this place where he's been confronted with his life to this point, confronted by the risen Savior Jesus, confronted with the idea that he kind of gotten it all wrong, the vision, the ability to see what could be, it was going to require a few things. First of all, it required that Paul have a heart that was ready to be conditioned. Not a heart that was stubborn, not a heart that was obstinate. You know, when, when Paul was confronted by Jesus and Jesus told him, go into the city and wait, Paul was, he didn't lose um, the character of, of being a volitional being, of being a person that had free will. No, Paul, he had, he, he had the ability to exercise free will. He could have said to his comrades around him, well, that was a crazy thing that just happened. Right? Are we going nuts or what? Let's carry on our mission. Of course, he's blind now, so it's going to be a little tougher to do. But Paul was still, he was still a person that possessed the ability to choose for himself what he wanted. But this is what happened. When Paul was confronted by Jesus, it says he fell to the ground. He heard that voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, Paul, to this point, had thought everything he had done in his life was good. He thought it was great. He had thought he had scored A plus after A plus after A plus, that he was on this career track and career trajectory that was going to take him all the way to the top of the Jewish hierarchical and religious system. Right? I mean, he was going to be the man. He was going to be it. He was large and in charge. But now he's confronted with the idea that he had gotten it all wrong and had to ask himself, how could I, how could I have been so wrong and how, how did it all go wrong? Well, here's, why, here's, here's, I think, at least part of the reason. Paul had uh, very similar DNA to, to you and me. And our DNA is such that it has been cursed by sin, right? When, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, They created this chain reaction that has made sin and sinfulness and the curse of sin the common experience of every person. How many of you know that sin is a common experience to all of us? Wow, we got a lot of perfect people in here. That's that's all right. I'll get them in third service. I know. All the perfect people come to second service. No, sin is the common experience to all of us, right? The thing that probably unifies us the most as a human race is that we are all under the curse of sin. We're all 
prone to want our own way, to be our own boss, and to do our own thing. And part of our problem as human beings is this thing inside of us called the human heart. The diagnosis for, for, for the reason why Paul had gotten it all wrong was because he, like all of us, had a human heart. You know what the Bible says about the heart? It's a little different from what we say in our you know, contemporary society that says, you know, follow your heart, follow your gut, do what your heart tells you. Right? Wherever your heart leads you, that's where you should go. Do whatever makes you happy. Do whatever makes you feel good. Right? That's, that's, that's contemporary society. Well, really, that's, that's not contemporary. That's, that's the entire history of mankind. People following after their heart. You know what the Bible says about the heart? Jeremiah, in God describing the condition of his people, the Jews, he says, the heart is the most deceitful of all things. What? More deceitful than my teenager? Yeah. The heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. And that's a lot different from follow your heart, go wherever your heart tells you, isn't it? That is quite the, uh, that is quite the accusation there. The heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? I want you to think about that for a moment. The beating inside of our chest today is a heart that is prone to lead us astray. That thing that we think provides the voice for what we should choose to do and not do. That intuition that we feel like we have wired as human beings for self-preservation, you know, looking out for number one. We think that we know what's best for us, and yet if, if we agree with what the Bible says, the Bible here tells us that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Again, Paul thought, thought he was doing it all right. Like, like, more so than any of us have probably ever thought that about ourselves. You think about the choices that you're making or have made, the way in which you're living your life, and you say, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing it my way. It's the right way for me, and this is just, man. Paul was utterly convinced. I mean, I, I bet you he was willing to give his life for this mission that he found himself on. And look just how wrong he was. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. So what's the cure for this heart? If we're living under the curse of sin, well, the prophet Ezekiel talks about a time where God would do something new in the nation of Israel. He would cleanse their land from their idolatry. He would clean them up. And here's what God says to them as individuals. He says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. This is some kind of radical transformation that God is wanting to perform in the lives of every person who would come and follow him. This is the promise that he makes to us. He says, I will take that heart that's made of stone. How many of you would say, man, I know there have been times in my life where it has felt like my heart was just made of stone. It didn't matter what was going on. I was going to do things my way. I was going to have my way, and I was not going to bend to the will of anybody else. Right? That's the human condition of the heart. And God says, I'm going to take that stony heart, that heart that it's impossible to penetrate, and I'm going to put a new heart and a new spirit in you. What we need, if we're going to see the miraculous taking place in our lives, is we need a heart that is being conditioned. Secondly, we need a posture that is ready for orders. We need to come to this place where we're ready, standing, listening for the marching orders that God wants to give to us on any given day and at any given moment. I don't know about you, but I'm certainly guilty of carrying on through my day, carrying on through the week, carrying on through the month, making this decision after that decision with very little thought and regard for, well, what, is, what, what does God want for me today? What does God want for me in this moment? What does God want for me in this instance? How often do I let God help form and make the decisions? And how much... 
How often do I just instead just kind of put the blinders on and go forward and march to the beat of my own drum? No, if we're going to experience the miraculous, we need to have a posture that is ready for orders. Jesus again said to Paul, he said, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. How many of us like those kinds of instructions? Man, don't we hate that? Go into the city and wait and you'll be told what to do? I don't need to be told what to do. I know what to do. A posture that is ready for orders. This, this disposition before God that says, God, what is it that you want for, for me? Instead of, what is it that I want for myself? Because, you know, far too often and far too many ways I act for myself. And God's saying, hey, I want you to stand here and I want you to wait and I want you to listen for what it is that I want for you. I believe that God wants to radically change the approach that we take to so many of the things in our lives because approach can, approach can make or break us, right? The way we approach things can mean the difference between overcoming the obstacle and failing to overcome the obstacle. I think about these people running the Tough Mudder course, right? The approach means a lot. The way in which they engage that obstacle is going to make a difference as to whether or not they're successful. Now, my son Zachary and I, we watch a lot of American Ninja Warrior. What's interesting about that is that, you know, I think about those athletes that are being asked to do just incredible things, things that I couldn't even begin to imagine. I mean, I know I look like a specimen of upper body strength here, but I promise you, if I were to shed these layers, you'd be very disappointed in what was, what was behind here. Right? But I watch these athletes, and you know what's, you know what's true of all of them? They all, can, they all can complete the obstacles. I mean, they've trained, and they've worked, and they've built things in their backyard to get them ready for various things. But the difference between those who make it through an obstacle and those that don't oftentimes is their approach. And you'll hear, you'll hear the commentators talking about they should have held it this way instead of this way. They should have leveraged their weight this way or the, their momentum that way, and they did something different. And so they failed, and they fell in the water. They got all wet. How many times do we find ourselves getting all wet because our approach is just all messed up. The way we approach our finances is messed up. We approach our finances with, with our own thinking and our own mindset. We feel like we know what's best for us, and so this is how we're going to manage our finances. And instead of thinking about how to do it in a God-honoring way, we think about how to do it in a Josh-honoring way and look at the kind of trouble that we get ourselves into. Right? We find ourselves in a situation now where it's like, where, how did I end up here? How did I get myself into this mess? How is it that I'm facing this obstacle that's just too big for me to, well, maybe my approach was all wrong. Approach can mean everything. It can, make the, the, it can mean the difference between success and failure in our relationships. Right? There's a way to approach your relationship with your children. There's a, a way to approach a relationship with your spouse. There's a way to approach your relationship with your employer, your employee. Right? There's a way in which there's an approach that we have that's going to make the difference between whether or not that relationship is successful. So approach can mean everything. The instructions that were given are often very easy, but the execution of those instructions can often be very hard. Think about the instructions that Jesus gave us. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Like, if you were to just take them all and rank them in order, what's number one? What did Jesus say? Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Is that, is that complex? Is it complex to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? No, it's not complex. The instructions are simple. The execution of what it means to love God with all my heart, to live my life in such a way that it could be said, he loves God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, all his strength, right? That's, that's the hard part. Overcoming the obstacle, like technically, from a technical standpoint, it seems like it should be simple. Like all you have to do is this, but the actual execution of that can often be difficult. The second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Is that complex? Anybody need to go to seminary? For six years? 
to learn what it means to love your neighbor as yourself? Does anybody need to go to a 15-week Bible study? No, it's not complex. But it is hard. We need a posture that is ready for orders. And number three, we need a friend that can share the burden. You know, this, this life that we're called to live, this life of living in the miraculous and the supernatural, this is not a life that we were called to live alone, in isolation and on an island. We need a friend that can share the burden. Later on in the story about Paul, so Paul's sitting there in darkness for three days, wondering, contemplating, thinking, regretting, all that stuff that's going on in his heart and his life and his mind. Meanwhile, God's speaking to this other person who is a follower of Jesus Christ by the name of Ananias. And he says, Ananias, somebody's expecting you to come, and so I need you to go. I need you to find this, go- this guy named Saul, and um, I want you to lay hands on him. He's blind right now, but you're going to lay hands on him, and he's going to receive his sight again. And Ananias is like, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. You said, you said Saul, right? Like we're talking Saul of Tarsus, like that Saul? I heard about that guy. He's no friend of ours, Jesus. You sure about this? And Jesus responds to Ananias and says, Go, for I must show through Paul what hard things, what difficult things I'm going to have to bring him through so that my name will be glorified and so that the good news of the gospel will be spread. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and he said, Brother Saul, that must have been something for him to say. I mean, he knew, he knew what Saul had done. He knew what defined Saul's life to that point. He knew what he was responsible for. As an enemy of the people that Ananias was in community with. And now here he stands before him. Brother Saul. Like there's this, it's small, but there's this, this sense of welcoming somebody who is wayward and lost and gone into the family of God. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight, so that you might get your miracle, that your sight might be recovered, and that you might be filled with the Holy Spirit. Doesn't that sound a lot like what God promised through the prophet Ezekiel when he said, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Later on, it talks about Saul trying to come into community with, um, with the Christians, with other followers of Christ, and, and uh, they don't welcome him quite the same way Ananias did. But Barnabas comes to Saul's aid and he says, Hey, I... I know what the Lord has done in his life. I know the transformation that's taken place, and you should hear this guy preach now. He's preaching Jesus. He's preaching the resurrected Jesus. He's preaching that Jesus came back to life from the dead. So Barnabas comes and brought to the apostles and told them all that Saul had seen and how he had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. You know what happened to Saul through this whole experience? What happened was he came to the understanding of what it meant to be obedient, and in that obedience experienced the miraculous work of God. Think about his life before. He was doing it his way, right? His education and his background led him to this place where he was an enemy of Christ, feeling like he was doing the work of God, committed wholeheartedly to that work, given his entire life to it, and, and, and now all of a sudden he finds himself doing a 180, right? So before, where Paul was just acting in the natural realm, working according to his own strength, now he was ushered into this new sphere where God was going to be working in and through his life, and now the supernatural was going to define his ministry, his life from that day forward. And the reason is the miraculous is stifled by our self-will, but it's unleashed in obedience. So often we fail to see the miraculous taking place because we're so busy having our own way that it makes it near impossible for God to do anything that he wants to do. 
But when we come to this place where we understand what it means to surrender to him and to be obedient to him on a daily basis, on a moment-by-moment basis, the degree to which I'm willing to surrender myself to what it is that God wants for me is the degree to which I'm going to experience the miraculous in my life. Now, let me warn you about a few things. As you commit yourself to the way, as you commit yourself to what it is that God wants for you, there may be some obstacles that present themselves. First of all, there may be some people who attack you. Right? The story of Paul here in Acts chapter 9 goes on. It says, after a while, some of the Jews, his own comrades, the people that he had surrounded himself with for all the years of his life, they, they were plotting together to kill him. Well, how about that for a turnaround? How about that for, you know, the people that you thought were your best friends? your associates, those people that were wanting the same thing as you, right? I, I mean, uh, Paul, Paul wanted the same thing as the Jewish people, and now he's just, he's been given this, this, this new reality. Oh my goodness, the Messiah. And, and I imagine that he probably immediately thought, oh, my friends from Rabbi College are going to be so excited to hear what Jesus has done in my life. I can't wait to tell them. Wow, Jesus is the Messiah. We missed him, but he, he, he's real. He rose from the dead, and pretty rude awakening, you know, as Saul or Paul is confronted by the reality that that community that he has left has now become his enemy. So some people may attack you as you make the decision to serve God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Those people that perhaps you have been surrounding yourself with for so many years of your life, they might not celebrate with you like you had hoped that they would. They might not be there rallying in your corner because of the better decisions that you've decided to make for your life. It just might be that they turn on you because some people will attack you. Some people will doubt you. How many of you have ever been doubted before? Some people might doubt you. The desire that you have to serve Christ with all your life and to see God work the miraculous in your life. Some people may doubt you. Oh, it's just another phase they're going through. They'll get out of it. Don't listen to the doubters. Don't listen to the attackers. Instead, surround yourself with the people who will carry you. Because I believe God will put those kinds of people in our lives. The band's going to come out and close us out in the song. The song that talks about the voice that God wants us to listen to in the midst of the many, many other voices that are going on around us, the voice of our hearts that's trying to lead us in one direction, the voice of our friends that's leading us in another, the voice of contemporary culture that's saying, do this, go here, do that. What we need to listen to is the voice of truth today. Right? There's one voice, the voice of Christ, the voice that speaks into our hearts and lives and says, this is what I want for you. This is what I want for your life. Here's the expectations and the plans and the purposes that I have for you. Because here's what I believe about God. And if I could, I, I'll use the analogy of what, and I'm sort of guessing, but as I think about the Tough mutter obstacle course, as I think about the people that engineer the various obstacles that people are going to have to face. I imagine they, they sit in rooms and they do their designs. And I'll bet you one thing that's never been said as a presentation was made was, oh, that's just too hard. You can't do that to them. That's probably never been said in a Tough mutter design course. The opposite's probably been said. You know, somebody brings this design and they're like, man, what are you, Ryan Howell? 10 miles, that's it? That's all you've got? No, that obstacle's way too easy. You can't do that. That, would, that ruins the brand of the Tough mutter, Right? So, so here these people are, like little demons, you know, just thinking about how hard, how difficult they can make the course. But I want to guess something else about them. I'll bet you they're not rooting against people making it through the obstacle. As difficult as they want those obstacles to be, as challenging, as far as they want to push human beings to do incredible things, 
I'll bet you they're the biggest cheerleaders for when somebody makes it over the wall. For when somebody gets from point A to point B. For when a team makes it to the end. I bet you they love to see the tears. I bet you they love to see the elation. I bet you they love to see the relief that comes across people who made it all the way through. As hard as they may have tried to make it. And you know what? I, I don't think that that's too unlike our experience in life. Here's the reality. The obstacles are hard. They're difficult. They're challenging. They feel like something that is far too big for us to overcome. And sometimes it can feel like in the midst of those obstacles that God's against us. That he's rooting for our failure. Right? That's just how it feels sometimes. So it's like, where are you? Here I am dealing with this and where's my miracle? Where's the supernatural? Where's my help? We think about God as being this designer of some course called life. And all he did was busy himself with making it as hard as he could, cheering against us, rooting for our failure. No, that's not God at all. As difficult as the obstacles may be, there's no bigger cheerleader in our corner. There's no, there's no greater advocate hoping for our success, wanting the best for you and me than God. And that's what he wants for us today. And so, as the song is sung over you today, would you just invite the voice of the Holy Spirit to speak to you and help you to understand what's that moment for you today? What's that, what's that I'm here for three days in darkness? I'm here in blindness. I'm here wondering, waiting, searching for what might be next. What is that moment for you today? It could be something really big that's going on. It could be something that's just little. But what's that moment where you need God to intervene, where you need to see the supernatural take place, where you need to see God do something that only God can do? Listen to the voice of truth. If you just bow your head, close your eyes. Let the Spirit speak to us today. What is the voice of truth wanting to tell us? What is it that he's wanting to reveal about us and our lives? Listen, it's not that God's angry. It's not that he's mad. It's not that he's on the verge of giving up on us. I believe that God wants great things for us today. So what is it? What is it that you so desperately need to, for God to do in your life, in your heart? As I close this in prayer, would you just surrender that thing to him? Would you commit yourself to what it is that you know right now, what he's speaking to your heart, that he wants you to do? Commit yourself to that thing. Father, we stand before you. And I pray that each of us would be ready to come and make that sacrifice before you. That sacrifice that says, God, here I am. All that I am, all that I've done, all that I've come from, all my hopes, my dreams, my plans for the future. Lord, I, I bring it all and I lay it before you and I just surrender myself. And I stand here ready. Ready to hear what it is that you want from me. Lord, would you help me to have a posture of obedience, one that's just ready for orders, ready for what it is that you want me to do next. And God, would you give me the strength and the power to walk in that thing and to fulfill what it is that you want for me. Lord, would you help me to overcome the obstacles? Would you help me to overcome those things that I'm facing right now, those giants, those waves? All that stuff that's going on around me that just seems to be laughing at me, deriding me, making me feel like I can't do it, I can't make it. God, would you just, would you put in me that new heart, that new spirit, and give me the strength to stand. Give me the strength to move. Give me the strength to go forward. For Lord, I surrender myself to you today. And I commit myself to live to live my life in a way that honors you, though not perfect. Lord, I know that when I fall down, you'll pick me up and we'll keep going. Lord, I know that when I fail, you'll raise me up and we'll forge ahead. And so, Lord, I invite you to not only be my Lord, to be my Savior, but God, would you just sustain me in what it is that I've committed to you today. I give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.